Good. Oh, wow. Yay. Oh, wow. Yes, yes, yes. This is going to um, be fun. Yeah. It is. It's going to be interesting. So, um, I mean, it, this is my first time actually giving a lecture on like my culture. Um, <laughs> Great. Unfortunately, because I'm using an iPad. Right. Unfortunately, because I'm using an iPad, I don't have like um, video materials and everything like that because I'm not. I wasn't. I'm not able to share the screen. Um, I mean, so I'm, what I'm going to do is we're going to be more of a conversation and I'm going to like use music references because I do have my phone and I do have a speaker set up. So that is possible. Okay. So um, that, that's, that's cool. Huh? That's great. Um, also, if you, if there are video clips you do you want to share, I can do it on your behalf. Or if that feels like a lot, also no. <laughs> <laughs> right now that might be a lot because I just I, I didn't completely when I figured out I could like once we did everything on Thursday and I feel like I couldn't do it and I couldn't get a laptop because I have to buy a new computer so that's a whole other thing um I think I'm okay if <laughs> yeah I think I'm okay because I mean I, I I know I know this is like less formal oh yeah no definitely they just want to talk <laughs> Yeah, so by all means, we can just talk. Like, we can talk, I can drop, I can drop a few facts, you know, everything like that, and we can just talk. But that's, I mean, oh, listen, I'm all for it. Just the stress the better. <laughs> you yeah, know, I'm for making this as easy as is humanly possible for everybody. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> so, but, um, Although, I mean, is it a great instance? Uh, well, I don't know if you guys get, um, is it a good deal of people that are interested, that are coming, that are interested? Oh, or, the, the Tuesday lectures are usually small, so it'll be intimate. Okay. Good. Yeah. Good. Yeah, we'll see. This will, this will be interesting. I, it's funny, I talk about, like, I talk to my parents about this all the time. But this, is, this is still very new that um the rest of the that other parts of the country are so interested in learning the culture of all of this mm -hmm. and so it, and it's kind of put us in a place where oh shoot we have to really think about like why we do all of this stuff and where about because none of it's codified so it creates a very interesting you know uh dynamic for us that are natives it's like okay we gotta figure out we have to figure this out, you know, so that, you know, because people are clearly interested. Um, <laughs> yeah, you have this new market. <laughs> Everybody that's not from New Orleans, like, is fascinated and wants to know, like, all about this. It's just, like, and it's so, so <laughs> different from what we do in, like, Detroit, for instance. That's where I'm from. It's like, oh, yeah. Yeah, it's so weird because it's just like, because like people are like, you know, I don't know how to dance. Like, I never forget when I when I first did the the workshop at Kume, the dance workshop for Second Line Dance. I was just like, I was like when they asked me, I was like, I'll do it. Like, I have to figure this out though. And I remember I told I told the class, I was like, look, I was like, these steps are not codified. I was like the way I learned how the second line was going to the second line break. Mm -hmm. And I never forget, I would never forget it was one time because like my family is very deep in it. Um, oh. yeah. Um and I remember uh one time we had the second line at the house actually. It was that it was that I don't know, maybe it was my maybe it was a funeral repast, perhaps. I don't remember because we would just randomly have second line. It just happened. Um, okay. And, <laughs> and um, I never forget my cousin was doing something, and I was like, "Oh, I want to learn how to do that." And then I verbatim, she said, "Just find the rhythm and fly. Like let's <laughs> move, oh. move the beat and fly." That is literally what she told me. And it was like. Okay. <laughs> That's like a 
an interesting point. I think when you like get into like the social dances, like, I mean, like, like they're not codified and that's kind of the point. The spontaneity yeah. of it is like, is the point. So yeah, I think at Kumbay, Baby, like we ride this interesting line. We teach these things, but the way these things exist inside of the culture is like, go. It's like, yeah, go it's to your day. organic. It, and then, I mean, you know, second line, because, I mean, and, you know, it's New Orleans, it's jazz. So just like the music, the dance is extremely improvisational. Mm -hmm. Like, there's no, like, oh, this is this move. No. No. <laughs> Interestingly enough, there's just like stuff that we just all do. <laughs> like it like and it's like it, it's not even that it's like this is how you do this. Not it's just that you get the second line, you go and like this is what everyone do, right? You know, the only thing that I could that I could know of that actually has a name is buck jumping. That is the only thing that I know of that has a name. And that's so vague. <laughs> <laughs> A so, name that like secretly means like four thousand things. <laughs> <laughs> right, you know. So if it's get hype, jump, bounce. <laughs> it's all it's like we're doing the reference with the same thing while going down the street. <laughs> so which like so, that's gonna be my next challenge with doing the workshop next month is of, like especially doing it in my like teaching that virtually. So be like so, how am I going to explain this? How am I going to break this stuff down? <laughs> I don't know. Do you just like, like make a party? And then it's like, okay, now there we go. <laughs> okay, now go this way. Okay, now no. go this way again. <laughs> right. Like, you know, but I mean, but like, but when I did do it, like, I, when I did the workshop, it was two hours. And they were tired, like they were just like, oh, that was a workout. I was like, right. I was like, well, one of the things about the second line, the second line starts at like 11 o'clock in the morning and ends at sundown. So oh. you're dancing in the street for like eight hours. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah, yeah no, it's, it, it, it's a whole thing. I'll get, I'll get into that. Like there are reasons, well, I'm not going to say these are the reasons, but it would make sense that these that these are the reasons that, that they're the, the reasons that I think we do it, especially if, like the reason why that maybe the data we do it and everything like that. I feel like there are um, unspoken reasons or or very or very spoken reasons, but we just were never told like, oh, this is why we do it on this day. It's just as I've done a lot of research and and history and learning and talking. To a lot of my elders from back home and stuff like that, um, I started to make some connections. So we'll get back. That's one thing we'll definitely get into. Oh, but, look at this! You're you're a scholar now. <laughs> this is scholarly. Uh, <laughs> I, you know, I guess. You know, <laughs> I don't know. I, I you know I feel like just as as, as as artists, um, Abdel Salam said, said it best sometimes, uh, you know, when we like, circle up before performances and everything like that, is that we're people of the theater, but the artists are not only, like, we're people of the theater, yes, but we're also keepers of the culture. So mm -hmm. in we wind up having to be scholarly because we have to kind of like preserve and make the connection between the past, the present, and the future. Mm -hmm. You know, so it's kind of like a byproduct. Like I wouldn't necessarily, I, I wouldn't necessarily, wouldn't necessarily tell them like oh, I'm a scholar or I'm an anthropologist or I'm anything like or anything like that. But as a byproduct of the work that of just being an artist in general, um, and and you know, especially if you wind up doing period pieces or you wind up doing like period ballet or me also being a musician and a singer, um, you know, learning, when you learn a piece, you have to learn the context in order to make sense to you, so that you, you know, communicate mm -hmm. that with your um, And I don't think people realize that. Like, it's more than just getting up there and doing what I love to do. Yeah. It's a lot more 
it's a, it, so in order for it to come across with some meaning, there's a lot of internal work that I have to do. Yeah, no. Like when I think about like what it is I do, I'm a dancer, but also like I curate and program things. Um, yeah. Like we like I think about the dancer um, as time traveler. Like we are, we are inherently in conversation with the past. Like always, we're in conversation with that lineage. Um, we're interpreting the now, but also it feels like we're planting seeds as we do these things that are very old from the past now. Like we're planting seeds for the future. So yeah. <laughs> we exist in all of those states. Yeah, I mean, every, everything is going to evolve. It has to. Um, and in that evolution, like, but you can't evolve if you don't know what you're evolving from and understand where you are now. If you, you can't then evolve from anything. So I think we just find ourselves in that place. As a musician, yeah. as a, I mean, you know, New Orleans is a music city. Uh, you know, I've been singing since I was five, and I started playing music. I started playing piano in like the third grade, and started playing clarinet in the fourth or fifth grade. Um, and even now, as I'm reconnecting with like my voice and stuff like that, and delving more into the classical world, which a lot of people don't realize, but you know, one. Everyone knows New Orleans for jazz and for second line and for all of that. But New Orleans has a very deep history with classical music as well. Um, because most people, if you were like Creole in New Orleans, someone in the family had to be classically trained in music. Mm -hmm. Like it was actually part of the culture. Someone had to be classically trained in music. One of the first philharmonics in the state. In, in the United States was actually in New Orleans. So there's in that kind of um <clears throat> that kind of history connected to it. Like and the reason why jazz comes to me because I mean jazz played on what would you with a usually classical instrument, a brass instrument. They played on trumpet and trombone and tuba and those instruments are not innately African actually. You know, if you really think about it, yeah, string instruments are African, and there's a couple of things, but like you were talking about brass, a, a trumpet, a trombone, a tuba, those things are not, and uh, those instruments are not necessarily indigenous to Africa or African culture, per se. It's more of a European thing. So then, even in how we put everything together, like in second mind, it is a mix of the French. Spanish and the Afro Native American all of it. <laughs> all of it. <laughs> so we will we'll, we'll get into a little bit of that as well. Okay. Yeah, this is fascinating. I'm already fascinated. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, trust me. It may Imagine growing up in it and then actually learning about it as you get older. You're like, oh, oh, and then you have all these aha moments. It's like, oh, so that, oh, that makes sense. Oh, I hear it. Oh, it's yeah. <laughs> you're just and you're just, you're just and you're just on this kind. It's like being a child all over again. It's just like now it all makes sense. Like yes, this all makes perfect sense. <laughs> <laughs> it's all been <business>. great. <laughs> so, but yeah, but yeah, it's definitely gonna be more of a conversation, and I'm and I'm definitely gonna like I'm in this in this particular thing. It'll probably be a lot of unmuting and muting because I want people to like ask and talk and things like that. Okay. It'll, yeah, I'm on top of that. You don't have to worry about yeah. that. Yeah. yeah, it'll it'll fuel the conversation, especially for an hour. <laughs> yep. I don't know. If it gets quiet, I might ask you some questions. <laughs> don't worry. Hey, that's fine. That's fine. Tr trigger some things, you know. Because <laughs> because I mean because it's it, you know it's a lot. It it just it really is a lot. It, it's a you know. And it's because most of it is not written down. You mm -hmm. know? Um, I mean, there's a lot of, because of YouTube and things, there's a lot of 
information on video on YouTube or from documentaries and stuff like that, but he can still a lot of it is not written down. A lot of the history is still is still being researched and still being passed down through, uh, through the generation and through the culture in and of itself. So, so yes. I mean, they take their sweet time coming in. Are we just of course. Like, these, these, are, these are elders, right? Yeah. There, there's no rush. <laughs> They're going to take their sweet time. They're going to be like, oh my God, how do I? I don't know how to. My parents are in their 70s. I understand. I'd be like, my mom will call me and she'd be like, well, dude, I tried. I was like, well, mom, I'm not there, so I can't help you. So, <laughs> I need you to call. Like, and the funny thing is, she can't completely rely on my siblings because my sister, there's such a big gap between me and my sister. Mm-hmm. My sisters are in their 50s. Really? Yeah. Wow. So, I, like, I can't even, like, rely on them to, like, <laughs> because that's, just, that's something they don't know. So it's like, okay, mom. Call Keandra. Keandra's like my best friend. Um, and her her son is my godchild. Mm-hmm. My godchild. And her and I, we've been friends since the fifth or sixth grade, something like that. Like, um, so I literally like mama called Keandra because also Keandra, she is finishing up her degree in uh, uh, computer. Science or technology sure. or something. I get, I get, I get them confused. I know that she, her, basically, she's like, she's on the track where she can like build programs. So oh. computer science, huh? Sure, yeah, computer science. Yeah. I don't know. I don't. Oh. I don't. I agree yeah. with you. <laughs> yeah, she's like she's on the thing where she can build programs. She knows how to hack into computers. She knows, like, that, because apparently they teach you that. <laughs> like, she told, when she told me that, I was like, they teach you to hack. She was like, yeah, she was like, it's a class. We have to learn. There's a class that we have to take that teaches us how to hack into a program so that we can make programs that are not hackable. Oh, okay, that makes sense. I was like, that makes sense, but God, this is why we have craziness. <laughs> like, and so it's like, so what happens is they, um, so the thing is, they're all, and what's funny is that they're taught, the class, I think the class that they take before that, they're taught to build, uh, to already build a program that is not hackable. And then in the next class, they have to take one of the, one of their classmates' programs and try to hack into the program to find the loophole, find the mistake. Oh. And I can go back and correct it. But I'm like, what? <laughs> like, okay. I mean, yeah, that is very thorough. <laughs> in, in the absolute sense, that is why we have encrypt- encrypted things now. But that's just a lie. Like, so you're, you're constantly trying to find loopholes so that you can correct the loophole. That sounds exhausting and never ending. Right! <laughs> 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 but then it creates the thing is like, so people can really, like, there are people. Like that really know how to hack. Like they know all the different ways you can hack into some of the more sophisticated programs. So then they can also build a, a more sophisticated program that's unhackable. Probably the reason why viruses are so, is like computer viruses can be so. And now it makes sense why there's an upgrade on freaking Apple products every other week. It seems. Yeah. I need those hackers to hack like Sally Mae or something useful. Please, please. Like, no. Really Buy all means. Can you do that? 
like that 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 would help a great deal <laughs> that's called a public service <laughs> <laughs> Oh, I mean, granted, you'll also go to jail for it. Like, you'll do serious time for it. But you will have help millions. <laughs> it depends on which country you do it from. If you do it in Russia, you're not going to jail for that. <laughs> <laughs> but we're going to fly to Russia. <laughs> uh, sure. Yes, there's a process. <laughs> oh, goodness. Hi, Lisa. Hey, how are you? I'm good. How are you? I'm doing pretty good. How's it going where you are? Oh, that's great. Nice to see you. Haven't seen you in a while. I know. I was out last last month. I forgot what it was going on. I think I was in some type of major meeting and just couldn't join in. It was kind of like, you know how it is. <laughs> you know yes. how it is. Yes, I do. <laughs> Zoom user. I don't know his name. Hi. Jude. Hi, how are you? I'm Jude. How are you, Jude? I'm Lisa, um, director of the program Your Circle. So I'm okay. just joining in. Um and oh. awesome. I think you're I think you're breaking up a little bit. Or is that me? Yeah, I've been having a lot of so I may join back in on my uh, on my computer, my other computer. So you know what? I'm gonna come okay. out and join there. Okay. I don't awesome. know what's going on. I'm gonna come out. Okay. You were serious. They don't think they do. <laughs> and yeah, we, we just, we're really okay with that. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> All right. <laughs> well, or I'll play a little bit of second line music. Just so you know. Great. Waiting music is nice. Right. Good morning. Everybody is ready. 
People will come in as they do. What? Do you just want to get started or come on in as? I mean, sure. <laughs> sure. I mean, it was 407. Um, I mean, I could. Yeah. I'm coming in now. I just thought about something. We have a, a gala tonight. So I don't know, a, a virtual gala at six. So I don't know if people are like my members. I don't know about anybody else. Mm -hmm. I don't know if my members are like, oh, you know what? Let me get ready for this event tonight. So that might, I was like, hmm. I just, I literally just sent um, Rikia that. I'm like, oh boy, we have a virtual gala tonight. That might be the reason why. You know how it is. It's so unpredictable. Yeah. It's so under, unpredictable, but that may be the reason why. So, I mean, I, I'd love to hear what's going on. And if this is something you want to reschedule, we could do that also and, and not do it tonight and just reschedule it all together uh, for next month. If that's something, Rakia, that you would probably mm -hmm. want to do. If we don't see anyone coming in and mm -hmm. something that, um, that might, that's an option also. So think about that. I'm very much open to it. Okay. Um, um, so, of course, that's up to y'all. So that's, I just thought, I'm like, oh boy, that might, you know, you know how uh, it's Yes. <laughs> These members are unpredictable. You think they in the house, they're outside and they're, oh no, we're at the beach. I'm like, what? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we have a, a social distance beach party going on, which is great that, you know. Love that. Yeah, because they get to the point where they can't, they, they, they say, oh, I don't like looking in this box anymore. Like, I can't do this anymore. And especially once it was nice. But today just might be what, what that's going on tonight. So this can literally be rescheduled if needed. OK. okay. So I'm, I'll, I'll I mean, be right back to, No, I'm here. Yeah, I, mean, I, I wait a couple more minutes until the time. Mm -hmm. yeah. Sure, we could just do that. But how's everyone doing anyway? <laughs> Managing day right. by day. I know. <laughs> doing our best. I yep. mean, it, we did find out that we lost one of our facilitators that was and well, someone's coming in now. So I thought I saw someone trying to get in. I think. Mm -hmm. We'll can talk later. <laughs> I mean, we can keep talking. That's Brittany. <laughs> oh, okay. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, we lost one of our facilitators last week. So, yeah, it's a little sad. Now. That's hard. Yeah, it is. I'm sorry. Yeah, that's hard. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, Brittany. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, oh, I was telling Brittany, I was just letting um, everyone else know that our members, there's a, we have a virtual gala tonight. So, our membership, I know, we usually have it very nice and cutesy in the real world, but now we're virtual. So that, that may be a reason for the lack of um, participants at the moment. And it, it is something open to redoing for, because I actually want to hear it myself, but it is something open, I'm open to redoing, or if you're, everyone's open to redoing it, 
um, because it's from six to seven thirty. So they might be like, okay, let me get something to eat. Let me go to that. They, so they might have opted to choose one or the other. So if it's okay. something that y'all are open to rescheduling, I'm very much opening to doing that because it's something oh. that I, I actually want to um, listen to. I went, I just was in New Orleans right before this pandemic. So, um, yeah. Oh, when, when, when did you go? Literally the week before we closed down. Okay, <laughs> I had just back. So, so I went home for body drop. Okay, you just got back. I went. We went the week after Mardi Gras for my sister's husband's fiftieth. So we went to New Orleans. Okay. It was, of course, a lot lighter than it would usually be. But literally, we were we and, and my sister and her husband caught COVID, and it, and oh, it, wow. they wow, they really thought that they got it. Well, my sister was like a carrier. She had no symptoms. She didn't even test positive. Her husband, no, she tested positive. Excuse me. She tested positive, thank goodness. But, but her husband tested negative and he had all the symptoms. So they had to go back like, no. Yeah, because you know how the body is structured. It don't, one, one works for one, doesn't work for the other. Yeah. It showed that because he was really sick and she was she took care of him, thank goodness. So, but thank goodness both of them are well now. I mean, I, I mean, I will, a funny thing is I will say the same for me. So I never got sick. Mm -hmm. um, but um, I, I remember when I when I decided when, when I was getting ready to start going back out in the world. <laughs> um, more specifically, when I was getting ready to start re resuming my vocal lessons with my vocal teacher in person, I went to go get a COVID test and I went to get the antibody test. And while I tested negative, which I figured I would because I was very very kind of like in my own box, um, I did test positive for the antibody. And I wasn't surprised. I was like, well, I was home for Mardi Gras. And New Orleans was just yes. as bad as New York at the beginning of it because of that. Of course. So it made perfect sense. I was like, I, I was like, I'm not surprised that I have the answer. Right. Well, I know <laughs> someone else just came on, so I don't want to um, take away, well, you know, we don't want to. No we can, I, I, I can, we can, we can start it. We can have a conversation. Cool. Um, I love totally it. Fine. <laughs> And then, and uh, and then, um, and then, like, if they want to, because of, um, I think I'm going to be doing a, a, a second line dance workshop next month, virtually. Mm -hmm. So, and I will probably, I will more than likely recap a lot of what I'm going to say right. when doing the workshop and just pair it with the dancing. Um, yeah. This is probably more so going to be about the music and the history rather than the dancing. So to speak. Awesome. Okay. So, yeah. Um, so, well, I will introduce myself. My name is Jude Evans. Um, I am born and raised in New Orleans, Louisiana, from New Orleans, Louisiana. I've been living in New York now for about 13 years, actually. Um, but yeah, I've been living in New York for 13 years. Um, and, uh, this is kind of a very interesting, um, opportunity for me to be able to talk about my culture. Um, especially given the track of my career here in New York City and, and making certain connections and correlations, it's just kind of interesting. But I will say this, um, and also when it's, it'll, it'll be a lot of back and forth, like by all means, talk, ask questions, all of that, because it'll help fuel the conversation for me. Um, and it's kind of hard. So as I'll start this, New Orleans Second Line is, um, the, even the history of it is something that is just traditionally been passed down like most African diasporic or really just indigenous uh, in, in indigenous history, the way history is passed down in this indigenous culture through like talking to your elders and through being in the community. The very um, nature of New Orleans Second Line has everything to do with the community. So um, a lot of people today, they see the, the second line parade that we would, that we probably have on every, like every Sunday, on any given Sunday in New Orleans, there's a second line parade happening in one of the neighborhoods. And it's always jubilant, it's always fun, it's always high energy, and it's always a great deal of people. Um, but there are reasons for that. 
there, there, there's uh, reasons why it happens on the Sunday. Sunday is a very, very, very special day for Black people in New Orleans, particularly when it comes to us being able to do things like that, that dates all the way back to uh, slavery. Um, well, we're doing, doing during the time of slavery in New Orleans, which was also a very interesting experience for, um, from the rest of the country. Um, so, as, as, as I, before I get to go down the rabbit hole that way, the name Second Line. Um, so, in, in the Second Line, usually you have the Second Line really is the name that you give for the people in the community that actually come in to join the parade. So the um the more direct correlation to New Orleans like to, 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 a, to the contemporary New Orleans second line start with the New Orleans Jazz funeral. The New Orleans Jazz funeral um, grew out of honestly necessity. <laughs> um, after so after the abolishment of slavery, um, New Orleans had a great number of freed Blacks um, before slavery. And then, of course, once slavery was abolished, you know, it was even more. Um, so one of the things, of course, that became it. So, of course, with that, with that abolishment, you had a lot of... Um, you you had the whole gym you had the, the whole recon, you know the reconstruction period and then you have like that whole like Jim Crow thing that comes along. So which was you had you had a lot of ass like fairly affluent free black that were not necessarily poor, but they were not allowed to be to um be a part of like insurance companies. Uh the insurance com the life insurance companies were not selling insurance to the to your black or your your Creole blacks, you your black New Orleans, your free slave, even if they did have the money to be able to afford it. So what the black community started to do was create what's uh, called the uh, Social Aid and Pleasure Club. Um, these clubs were a group of people in the community that paid dues like every, every month or every year into a pot. Essentially, they pay dues to be members of the club. One of the perks, of course, with being a member to the club, of being a member of the club is, and the main reason why they were formed, if you passed away or someone in your family passed away and you were a member of that club, they put the bill for your funeral, um, for your home going, and which you got because you were a club member, you got a grad band. And that brass band would meet you at the church, would meet the family at the church after the church service, and will play as the casket is coming out of the church. There is a ritual kind of like dance that will happen with the with the casket that is very free, but also things happen in three. Um, a lot of people can say because New Orleans is also a very cat like historically, it's a very Catholic city. Especially when it comes to Black Catholics, so everything kind of happened in three, uh, in threes, whether it be for the past, present, or future, or most people say it's for the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, which is the Holy Trinity. Um, so there's a point where they will dance with the casket, they'll lift it up, and everything like that. And while this is happening, they'll play what's called a dirge or a dead man march, um, which is really just a slower version, a, a, a slow song. Usually it's an improv jazz version of um, of like a hymn. So I'm going to play one for you right now that's very popular. We play it all the time at all of the jazz funerals in New Orleans. Um, and you probably will know, be able to hear it. Hold on. So one thing, you, one thing you'll notice when you listen to this there is an entrance that the bass drum does. Um, and it's a signal. Everything has signals. Just like in like African drumming and, and all that kind of stuff, there's always a signal for things to come in. There's always a signal for things to start. And it's usually always a sound cue. So um, here is, here's an example of the dead, of a, a dirge or a dead man's march. Thank you. 
Thank you. 
about both of these songs. Both of these songs are actually church hymns. Um, the first song, The Dirge, was a church hymn called um, Just a Closer Walk with Thee. And this particular song is a derivative of Just a Little While to Stay Here. So that also will let you know, like, the nature of when it comes to the jazz funeral, the second line jazz funeral, um, the nature of what the moods are for the different the different parts of this. The dirge is really, really comforting. It's comforting the family, it's comforting the community because we are losing and we are still mourning this person. At this point, you cut the person loose, you cut the spirit, the cut the person's spirit loose. And you're kind of rejoicing because this song is saying, just a little while to stay here, just a little while to wait, you know. And it's all about, like, because the spirit loose, because now this person is going home. Um, so that is that is kind of the significance of this in the old jazz second line funeral. Now, nowadays, what happens is you'll play that, and then there's probably even a more upbeat rhythm that winds up getting played which is a derivative of the bambula rhythm, which is probably when you hear New Orleans second line music now, that's what you're more accustomed to hearing. So a little bit going back even further before that so that we can get into why we second line on Sunday. New Orleans, if, um, if most, most people don't necessarily know this, most people and then some people do. New Orleans during the time of slavery was one of the only places on the United States soil that did not outlaw the African drum. Um, also, it is also one of the only, it is probably uh, one of the only, if not the only places on, the, on American soil where the slaves actually had a day off. Um, that day off was Sunday. Hence the reason why Sundays are so important to us. So if you go to New Orleans, there's a, if you go to New Orleans and you go outside of the, right outside of the French Quarter, because the French Quarter is actually the main original part of New Orleans. You go right outside the French Quarter, which is now Rampart Street, and you go into Louis Armstrong Park. There is a, there is a spot in Louis Armstrong Park that's right on the corner of Rampart and like this little, Curve Street that is called Congo Square. Congo Square is where the slaves were allowed to gather on Sundays and they were allowed to dance, they were allowed to sell their goods, they were allowed to practice their rituals, they were allowed to play their music, they were allowed to just be. And so that was, the, and, that, and also that was also the day when the, when the, your, your enslaved black or your enslaved creole uh, creole people and your free black and free creole uh you know creole citizens of, of new orleans or creole people of new orleans and your dark skinned native americans would all come together and mesh and meld and exchange secrets and all of that kind of stuff so and it's, and it's also in this where bambula which is a rhythm that is that actually was played in a lot of places in the Caribbean. Um, the bamboo rhythm would have been played here and it would have been danced. The, the, the people would have been dancing to it. They also would have played and danced the kalenda during this time. So the bamboo rhythm, it, um, the bamboo rhythm is actually very, very simple. It's, it's very close to the rhythm that you would hear in Afro-Latin music like the, to the with the clave and everything like that, which makes sense in New Orleans since New Orleans for the uh, was French, then Spanish, then French again. Um, there are a lot of re uh, reasons. Another reason why there were a lot of free blacks in New Orleans is because after the Haitian Revolution happened, what happened is a lot of the free blacks that were in that that were in Haiti, they then moved to New Orleans because New Orleans was the new territory, the new French territory. And of course, Haiti was going through an economic downturn because the Europeans were upset. Um, so what happened was a lot of the a lot of the free free blacks from Haiti moved either up to New Orleans or they moved over to Cuba. 
So then that's how you get you know, the first Haitian neighborhood in New Orleans, which is actually what's now called the Trump, which, uh, actually, which is which is now Louis Armstrong Park. Louis Armstrong Park, which is where Congo Square here is, is actually, was, was actually the first Haitian neighborhood in New Orleans. So for that, that park and Congo Square for us, Black New Orleans is still sacred ground because that is exactly where, like they didn't move Congo Square. It's not just commem like a commemorative space. That is actually the where Congo Square was during that time. Um, even now to this day, they still go to Congo Square. They'll play their drum, they'll sing their songs, they'll dance, they will dance, we'll do all of these things and still very sacred ground for us. Now, the Bambula rhythm is a rhythm, it's, it, um, it, I'm gonna clap and I'm gonna play something so that you can hear it, if it's wrong. But it, it literally sounds like this. That's the rhythm. That is the base of the Bambula rhythm. So you can throw it up, or it can speed up. So, what happened with what happened for us that was celebratory for us that was us being ourselves that was us giving thanks that was us taking a break from our week that was all those things during the time of slavery we still do that now on sundays is always a second line and also during that time of slavery this can only happen while the sun was still up as soon as the sun started to set the slaves needed to be back by their back on their plantations and back to their perspective places. So, okay, that is very very important because now if you go to a New Orleans second line on a Sunday, just random a random a random second line that happens every Sunday in New Orleans, the second line will start at like eleven or twelve o'clock in the afternoon, and it will parade the neighborhood and go all the way until six seven o'clock at night or until sundown. So in that like so very it could be coincidentally, it could be very deliberate, but that is the recognition to what our ancestors would have done on a Sunday, which was their day off of slavery. So we still do that now. I'm gonna let you hear the bamboo rhythm with a drum, and then I'm gonna play one of the more contemporary um New Orleans second line song so that you can hear what it developed into. And if you have any questions, do feel free to ask. Like this is an open conversation. <laughs> I like I I I so as, as much knowledge as I've acquired, I am all about sharing it. I have a question, I'm, and I'm hoping that no, I don't think you did. Yeah. What made the horn so um, popular? What was what's the history of the horn being so um, very much a personality of New Orleans music? Um, that uh, that goes that 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 kind of goes to the to the uh, the French group, the French Creole group. Um, because really what, what, what the second line band was, the second line band or the brass band as we know it was a derivative of the brass marching bands that were in, in France and in Europe and all of that. So that's kind of where that came into play. Also, um, music in general was such a very, very big part of, uh, of families in New Orleans, especially if you were Creole. Someone in your family had to be trained to play music. Um, whether it be piano, whether it be trumpet, whether it be uh, clarinet, whether it be trombone, whether it be tuba, all of that, 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 it came from the whole, that was the European aspect, that, that whole marching band culture, that, that the whole like military marching band culture that came from France and that came from, this just came from Europe in general. So then, with, 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 with what you have is you have these 
you have those that have been trained, and then you have those that are not necessarily trained, but they pick up an instrument. And like Louis Armstrong, they pick up an instrument and they kind of taught themselves how to play. And then what they did was they, you know, they took things that they thought that they knew, songs that they heard, and they even still do it today. They took popular songs, they took hymns, they took, um, I would imagine during that time, um, some of the traditional marches. And what they would do is they would add, they would play them and add the syncopated rhythm underneath it. And because, you know, probably they didn't, they weren't necessarily always, everyone wasn't necessarily always properly trained, especially um, as you get, uh, in, 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 as you get to more recent time, interestingly enough, a lot of your, um, when you, when you start talking about like around like the, the 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, even the 90s, a lot of people in the black neighborhoods could not afford music lessons by talking about it. But everyone in their family played an instrument. Like for me, I, I played clarinet. I also played, I started piano lessons, but I played clarinet. But it's like, not only me, but like, my cousin played clarinet. I had another cousin play saxophone. I had two cousins that played drums. And my grandfather was actually a member of a social aid and pleasure club. So, and he enjoyed that music. And that's actually how we bonded with our instruments. But it really kind of dates back to that whole like French, um, that French European military marching band. And then you take, you take those instruments and then you pair it with the African rhythm and you add on the fact that, okay, well, I don't necessarily know how to play this in this way, or I am or I feel like I want to add this little extra, or I may have to shift it so that it can fit this rhythm. And that's how you then get the, the sound of New Orleans Second Line from these brass instruments. Again, now it's usually only brass instruments. Back then, there was usually a clarinet involved. Um, and so in some of the old New Orleans jazz and old New Orleans second line music, you will hear a very high pitched instrument, which is actually the clarinet, that kind of sings and sings and kind of like almost wails a little bit on top of like the trumpet and everything. So the trumpet usually always carries the lead. And then you have the trombones and everything that kind of do this want this is like wailing kind of like down, so you have a clarinet that kind of winds and because the clarinet is able to bend notes and it's able to pierce through in a different kind of way than the other instrument. So, and of course, the tubas and that, your tubas is just like your bass drum and everything, it keeps the rhythm and it keeps the bass going um, and it drives the rhythm forward. So, um, yeah, I hope that helped. I hope that answered your question a little bit. Yeah. Um, so that's that's kind of like where the horn comes in. Um, so I'm gonna play this. And the uh, uh, oldest rhythm. And it sounds just like it's uh, its name. It's played just like its name. So you can hear. But um, 
you'll be able uh, I want to see I want you to know if you can pick out that rhythm. Hold on.
and we celebrate everything. You know, we have a thing back at home. And we sure people, a lot of people up other places have this thing, have a version of the thing too. You cry when a child is born. You celebrate when the soul leaves the earth. You know, we literally celebrate. We celebrate we, because it's all a part of life. So we celebrate loss. We celebrate transition. We do a second line for a funeral. We do a second line for a wedding. We do a second line for a birthday party. We do a second line just because. Because it's literally just how we how we give thanks for life. For life is how we give thanks to and how we honor our 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 culture and our history and those that came before us, our ancestors that came before us. Um, it is a way that the history and the culture is passed down through generations. You know, it's a it, it's a dance. It is more than just dance. It's more than just music. It really actually is a culture. Um, and it's a culture that you kind of have to experience it to fully understand. You have to be. You have to go to the second line. You know, at some point in time, because I can. We can talk about it all the time. You can do all the research. You can look at all the pictures, but it really is a feeling. It really is a situation like you have to go and be in it to really understand what it is for us. Yeah. Is there are there any questions? I definitely <laughs> um, you know, um, there's so much more, especially when we start going into like the Mardi Gras Indians, which are now the descendants of dark in Indians and slaves that have and even that even that music that that mixing the that the mixing of those cultures and the music that came out of that has its place in water and second line as well. But that's a whole other thing in and of itself. Um but do you have any questions or anything you know any comments, anything like that right now. We have about nine more minutes so um I'm willing to, yeah, I will use I use the time to like take whatever questions or anything that anyone has. I mean, can you talk a little bit about the dancing that happens with this? Cause I, I know y'all dance. <laughs> yeah, so okay, so the thing is, huh. The dancing is it's always so interesting. Um New Orleans, the New Orleans Second Line dancing is not very much like the music. It's not really codified. Um there are steps that we that everyone kind of just does, but it's not like you go to school and learn how to second line. Um I I remember very much so we were we had a jazz funeral and I believe it was at the retail. And one of my cousins, um, like my, like the whole family was dancing. So here's another thing: the same people that were like crying and trying to get in the casket and about to fall into the grave with the on body is the same people that will get out the car and dance and cut up when we have to cut them out, when we when we cut the spirit loose and when the music picks up. And again, it's that whole thing of like you mourn but you celebrate. Um, with that being said, I remember we were dancing. Um, the repast was at one of my cousin's houses when we were dancing. The second line band came to the house. And my cousin was doing something. I was like, oh, I want to learn how to do that. And my cousin literally said, just feel the rhythm and fly. That's literally what she knows. Um, but there's a lot of footwork in New Orleans second line, which probably has a lot, which probably can, I'm not, I'm going to, I'm not going to say this is fact, but in my in my making the connection in terms of like the history, um, the overall history of the black a uh, black New Orleanian really of uh, whether a black Creole in New Orleans or a black Cajun in New Orleans, um, or a black Indian in New Orleans or anything like uh, you know, anything that's within that diet with within the black diaspora. Um the dances like the Bambula and the Kalinda were, were very sad and had a lot of intricate footwork. And so I would imagine that, and then even, even when you think about the, like some of the dances that the, the Mardi Gras Indians or the, the, the Black masking Indians 
do. All of it is really, really heavy on the footwork. So I would imagine that that just got tasked along with the, the bamboo rhythm. What happened is over time that got tasked and it just evolved into what people see now. I mean, there is one, there is kind of like one thing that we do called buck jumping. Um, but it's, it's, buck jumping is so vague and it's uh, just like it sounds. You know, we have this thing like, oh, I'm buck up. It means I'm excited. So buck jumping is like jumping with excitement, <laughs> essentially. And there's so many derivatives of that, you know, but a lot of, a, a lot of those, a lot of those steps and a lot of those dances, honestly, you, when you go to the second line and you see you like my cousin was like just do the rhythm and fly that is literally what you do like you kind of just in this you kind of in the crowd also you have to take into consideration that it is a parade so this is not a stand in one place kind of thing it's in a parade so it's you know and, and i'll go more even you know i'll be able to do some things that we may do in the second line parade or some dance when i teach the workshop next month but um, all of the stuff that you, you have to keep in mind that all of the stuff that you are doing to dance to the music, the movement rhythm of the music, also has to move you down the street. Because it is a mass group of people. It's like, what the protests look like in New York is what a second line looks like on a Sunday. It's that many people in the neighborhood and there's really happening and there's this and people are drinking and all that kind of stuff and but all it's all of that that is happening and with all those all those people are are partying down the street in this neighborhood and the people are coming out of their houses we kind of know when the second line is happening but we didn't always know you just hit that on sometimes they would just like it would just be a band of a, a band of youth in the neighborhood that would just up and everyone would just come outside and next thing you know you dancing and praying down the street and you you're like three miles from your house <laughs> and don't even realize it you know but that is something to think about when it comes to the dancing so it it, it 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 very much could very well be a derivative of like the kalenda and the bambula and a lot of the dance that the phases of the combo were because they were very fast they were very very fast dancers like they were you know what? One of the things with the Kalenda and the Bambula, they would have these contests, and in the contest, it was like with the rhythm continuously speeding up. Who can outdance who? Who's going to get tired first? Who's going to fall out first? And so all of that footwork and stuff like that, and on all of that energy goes on through history, and we're here. And we are kind of all have the same thing and stuff like that. But again, all of that has to move you down the street. So you're outside in the sun, you're drinking, there's 8 billion people around you, and that mass of people is all moving down the street behind the fan. So I think that would be another thing to, that would be informative of like what the steps are. Like, and there are times when the parade does stop. But for the most part, everything that you do is moving you down the street. There are some steps that would look a lot like a cake walk used to look. Um, you know, there are some steps, more contemporary steps now when it comes to second line that you look a lot like house, a lot of like the steps we do it and and you know in, in house with house music and everything like that. Um, because it's also still all the same culture. It's just it's it's all the same general African diasporic culture. It has just been flavored differently based on where they are in the world. And in New Orleans, we have our own flavor to it. You know, um, we have our own, you know, our own je ne sais quoi about it. You know, um, a lot of the steps are very prideful. They're, you know, none of the steps are, um, even the dirge, it's respectful, but it's not sorrowful. Um, there's never a step really where the head or, or there's never a step that there's not a step in second line that admits any kind of defeat. Um, you know, when you're doing the dirge, and I, I will touch on just like the walk that they'll do in the dirge when I do the workshop, but the dirge is it's very proud. Your chest is open, you're kind of looking up at the heavens, you may have like your you know, you may have your fan or whatever, your fan of feathers cross over your heart, but it's still prideful. And when they're dancing with the casket and the dirge, you know, they do things where they 
and Mr. Cat is up above everyone. And then there have been there 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 are videos on YouTube and you can look them up where there there are times when they will they will literally take the casket out of the hearse, put it on the ground, and people will dance on the casket as a form of celebration. There's nothing about even when it's a when it's a jazz funeral or a home going ceremony, a home going service. There's nothing about it that is that is defeated. And all of it is jubilant. All of it is Thanksgiving. Um, you know, I was looking at something a little earlier, and and someone was talking about the bamboo dancers in the Caribbean and how they were dancers of um of um for lack of a better phrase, protest. They were they, they were they were dance of defiance. They were dance. You know. Nothing about it said we are defeated. Um, and you have to take into consideration in New Orleans, you can't talk about New Orleans culture without talking about Haitian culture um, or, you know, Cuban culture, because even with that, so like after the Haitian Revolution, yes, the, some of the free Blacks free black from Haiti came to New Orleans and then some went to Cuba, but then there was a falling out that happened between the Spanish and the French. And when that happened, the ones that were in Cuba that would have been on the Santiago side of Cuba came back up to New Orleans. So now you have this culture of people that have, that were already successfully defiant. These, these black, these, these black, Creole, Haitian, Cuban people of African descent that were all that already were successful in being defiant in Haiti because that whole revolution happened. And you so then you take that culture of defiance, you take the, the religious culture of voodoo that was that by which, you know, is another reason why in New Orleans there are a lot of um, uh, black Catholics because what they did with voodoo is similar to what, similarly to what they did with Santeria. They think or disguise the loa under the Catholic saint. Because in order, in order to venerate the Catholic saints, you lit a white candle and you would pray and venerate the saints and stuff like that. So then the way that they could keep their religion alive in the open. So, I mean, they did practice it at night. They, did, they were able to practice it in Congo Square because at that time, Congo Square, even though right now it's not in the outskirts of New Orleans, at that point, Congo Square was in the outskirts of the city. It was actually part of the woods. So, um, but uh, they, they, oh, what was I saying? Uh, <laughs> they, um, they, they were able to, they, they were able to, that, that's how they were able to save their religious culture and save all of those practices and save all of that music and save all of those dances and everything like that was to mask them under the Catholic point. Um, and also mask them and also do them on Sundays in Congo Square. And then now you have the bamboo, which the bamboo is also a derivative of a voodoo rhythm. You now have that in our music that we play when we celebrate, you know, we celebrate transition or we're just celebrating life in general. Um, so that, it, it's all kind of interconnected. The steps, <laughs> the steps like the music are like highly improvisational, but they still have roots in the stuff that they did with the rhythms that have evolved to be a part of the second line. They still have the roots in the stuff that were done to those rhythms back in those times. So it's all connected. It's all connected. And it's and it's one of the things like for me I didn't realize how connected it was until I got older. Um because when growing up in it, it's just a part of you. You don't realize all of this stuff, and especially, you know, and especially for those, like, even my friends and stuff that still live back at home, they still don't really understand how unique and how connected we are to, like, our past there. Because for us, it's just, it's, it's just a daily way of life. Like, it's just, oh, we are in the second line. Like, I would go to church, sing in the choir, leave church in my suit, and take and shoes and go to the second line <laughs> and sweat and my parents were okay with it so i mean that's you know that's 
Yeah, that's the spirit of it. You know, it's the spirit of that's the spirit of the step. It's nothing about nothing about it is 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 defeated at all. It's all celebratory. Even if you're tired, it's just like you're still you're still pushing on. You know, you're still pressing forward. You're still celebrating. There's still something to celebrate. You lost your job. There's still something to celebrate. You know, um, you know, someone passed away. There's still something to celebrate. You lost your, I mean, we have a second line to commemorate Katrina. You know, every every year for Katrina, every, every year for Katrina, the way we commemorate, the way we commemorate uh, some really catastrophic things that have happened to the world is by celebrating. Because we understand that, like, there's still a rebirth that has happened. There's still life that continues to go on, you know. Um, and we are maybe a very spiritual city. Some may not necessarily subscribe to that, but inadvertently we are. <laughs> so it's what happened. Um, but did that help? Did that did that answer that a little bit? Yeah, that was, that was great. <laughs> oh, okay. Um, uh, <laughs> It's 5.05. Do we have any more questions? <laughs> yes, yeah, no, maybe I, so. I just I just enjoyed learning more of the history and I appreciate it very much. Thank you so much. I can't wait to go back again now. Um, like I've done, but I just can't wait to go back again. So I appreciate yeah. it. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and when you go back, um, you know, see, see if you can if you can figure out, if, 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 especially if you're there on a Sunday, see if you can go to the second line, you know. Um, see if you can, you know, or pay a visit to Congress where, you know. Because um, also in Louis Armstrong Park is like, I mean, so the, the the house that Louis Armstrong lived in when he was in New Orleans, that he was born in, is there as well. There's, just, there's so much history. Um, there's so much history behind what we do. Um, that again, sometimes we're just we're not even privy to it until we're in a situation like this where we have to like talk about it, and then it's like we wind up finding out more information and starting to start making more connections, you know. Because again, we're just simply living; we just live our life. It's just a part of who we are. To everyone else, it's just it's just fascinating dance and music style. To us, it's just life. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> Thank so, you, Jude. Uh, I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you enjoyed it. Um, of course, there's always so much more to it. There's so much more in-depth knowledge. But you know, I just wanted to just be very, very informal and to kind of like give a taste and teaser. And like I said, um, I'm scheduled to do a, a a virtual second line dance workshop next month. I believe it's on the 15th. I believe. I think so. Yes, I believe it's on the 15th. Um, right. And so, so you send me that information. Huh? I was just saying to tell you to send me the info. Yeah, I'll send it over your way. Awesome. Yeah. Um, and so, I mean, and I'm going to touch on a lot of this stuff that I touched on today in there because it, um, you know, it, you can't, um, it's very hard to teach the steps and not teach the culture. It's not just like with African dance. It's hard to teach the African the, the actual dance without teaching you about the rhythm and why the dance is done and when it should be done and X, Y, and Z and where it came from and regions and all that. And so it's you know it's that same thing when it comes to New Orleans second line uh, culture. You can, I can't you know it's very hard to just teach the steps because. You kind of have to understand the rhythm to understand how to ride the steps. Because if you don't ride the steps according to the rhythm, then it will become a different dance. That's not necessarily more or less like that. So, all right. So, thank you Yay! all. Thank you. That that was fantastic. Thank you everyone for coming and sticking around. Fantastic information. So excited to take the workshop in November. I hope you all can join us and everyone enjoy the rest of your day. <laughs> all right. You guys be well. Be Thank blessed. you.
All right. Take care, everyone. Bless it. All right. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.